Well, hello and welcome. Joining us tonight is a man who spent three seasons in the Sky Blue after being an inaugural squad member in season one. That followed a very varied career which took him to England, Scotland, Germany and Switzerland. He has also travelled the world as a broadcaster, having spent time presenting and reporting for SBS's The World Game. Now he's into coaching and he is, of course, David Zrilich. Welcome, David. How are you doing? Where are you right now? Hey, mate. Uh, good to see you. Yeah, I'm in Chicago right now in my, um, in my uh, apartment here. And uh, yeah, the weather here is getting a lot better. So it's, uh, it's actually quite nice right now. And what exactly is it you're doing? Tell us who you're working for and uh, what sort of role are you, are you in at the moment? So I'm at uh, Chicago Fire in the MLS. Um, I'm an assistant coach here. And um, because of the whole situation, which has affected the world, the whole um, COVID situation, um, we were in lockdown for uh, almost three months. Now the um, restrictions have been easing. So we went from individual training a couple of weeks ago to small group training. Um, and now now we're in full team training with, with obvious... obvious um, um, protocols around it but we're able to train normally on the field which is great so um, for us here in the MLS we will have a tournament um, which will kick off the season that's happening in Florida in uh, they've got a wide world of sports uh, complex uh, in Disneyland down there in Orlando so we'll all be flying all the teams will be flying down there um, next week and then in a couple of weeks we'll be starting there and we'll basically be having three tournament games each in separate groups um, and those tournament games will double up as an actual tournament where the winner of the tournament will have a Champions League spot but those three group games will also um, count towards the league which will then um, keep progressing after the tournament's finished so um, obviously those games are going to have a lot of meaning. And, uh, this isn't your first coaching gig, though, is it? Uh, obviously, you spent a little bit of time at Sydney FC when you first uh, yeah. were starting up as your, your as a coach, uh, and then on to on to Leipzig. What were those two experiences like? Well, it was um, you know every every experience is is different, but um, you know look when you look at a traditional coaching journey. Um, Mine is, is definitely not that um, for, for, for varying reasons. I mean, I started actually at Sydney United when, uh, when I finished playing as a player coach. So I finished at Sydney FC and then went to Sydney United. And, and um, after Ante Milicic was player coach, he moved on. I then retired, became player coach. And, and that was my first experience uh, in a well, semi-professional environment. So that was the... the the first part of it, but also I, as I finished playing, I got into the media side of it, as you know, uh, we also work together in the media side of it. So that, that sort of <clears throat> combined with the coaching was, was, was where my post playing career took me. And yes, I did want to coach, but at the same time, the media career sort of just fell into a direction where um, I, was, I was getting quite good roles, um, obviously in terms of the financial side of it, it was, it, it, you know, it was providing more opportunity than the coaching side of it. So I was trying to do both, but the media career sort of jumped ahead very quickly. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to learn more about coaching. I just wasn't able to do it um, uh, in the same degree as others who, who jumped full on. And obviously there weren't many spots available in Australia, still aren't. So that was sort of where, where it took off. Um, Funny enough, Bimbi, current uh, Sydney FC coach, started his coaching career as a youth team coach at Sydney FC. And we were talking about doing that as well together. But the time investment of doing that and, and doing a media career was, was quite difficult to manage both of them at the start. So, you know, my, my career sort of took me to learning everything about coaching and football through the tactical side by being an analyst. And learning, you know, European football, all the Champions League, and all these, the tactical evolution um, from a different angle. And I think now, um, in hindsight, it's been um, it's been a great experience, and, I, and I'm really glad that I did it that way because I really looked at it from a different perspective in 
in not just focusing on the tactical side from my own team, but looking at what is this team doing? What is this team doing? How are they? And I think that gave me a better overview of actually what's going on in the field, not just from me trying to have my own philosophy and how is it, how is it matching up against someone else, but watching how everybody plays different philosophies. And I think that, um, that was beneficial. So yeah, then the second phase was actually then going to Sydney FC um, and working with firstly Rob, Robbie Stanton, who um, you know helped me a lot, and he had a he had a different view of looking at football, but very passionate. And he's obviously now, as you guys um, are well aware, um, very passionate assistant coach under Bimby there. Um, so that kind of different dynamic, different way of thinking. Um, all marrying up with my thoughts and putting it all together was great experience. Then I took over the the twenties um, for a short time before before making the jump over to Leipzig. And um, I think the whole experience there with Rob, um, and then obviously connected with uh, Arnie, Graham, Arnold, and Bimby and the guys, um, all that working together in the same same um, uh, close environment, uh, basically gave me that that next shot in the arm where I was like, geez, there's just, even in that 10 years or whatever it was when I was working in TV and analyzing football, coaching had jumped, uh, had evolved uh, rapidly. And I saw that. And then on a study trip or um, a visit to Leipzig where my old uh, uh, coach, Ralph Brandnick, was running the whole Red Bull network, he was sporting director there at the time. I spent three weeks there at Leipzig. And then when I went there, I saw, wow, this is just another level altogether. This was just, and it's, it's, it's the coaching with the mentoring, with the scouting network, with the whole Red Bull uh, network, the way that it all uh, ran together, the way the youth academy filters into the first team, um, all the mechanics behind the coaching, behind the whole network, was just something that you can't experience here in Australia or in many places around the world because you've got big networks around around the world like the City Group they have their clubs and all that but they don't have a they don't have such a integrated philosophy behind them I think Red Bull's the only only um, uh, entity that has a philosophy running through the whole veins of the network um, and, and in such a such an integrated way. So that was very obvious to me when I went there. And that's why even when I went back to Sydney FC and brought some of that methodology back with, with, with Robbie Stanton and, and myself and trying to integrate it, having some information and implementing it was okay. But going there and spending three years and really understanding how this, this, this philosophy works was a totally different experience, a totally level of totally different level of, um, of learning and understanding for me. But you actually started your career, um, I think, with St. George before you went on to, to Sydney United. Who were you sort of playing with and, and when was that happening at Sydney United? Like Savani, was he there at the time? Tony Popovich? Jelko Kalach? Yeah, so Arnie, Arnie was funny enough, uh, that was a little bit before my time when I arrived there, but um, Arnie was... was amongst that group that I used to watch. And I, being, uh, being um, born of uh, Croatian immigrants and um, so second generation, um, and then being born in Australia, but, but at that time there were the Sydney Croatians, the Marconis, the Sydney Olympics. So you had the Croatian, Greeks, Italians, and all these different cultures together. And obviously I was following Sydney United, Sydney Croatia back then. And, and Arnie was one of the guys uh, playing. So that was like, you know, that was my team, uh, and that was that was where um, you know a lot of my childhood was spent. So that was just a fantastic time. So then for me, growing up, I wasn't you know a lot of Croatian parents they would throw their their, their sons into especially into into football into into Sydney Croatia or or you know and that, and that was the dream. Whereas my family were my my father pushed me through school, so I didn't get all that kind of playing through the youth ranks like, uh, you know, like the, the Moriches, the Milicic's, the, the Popovic's, the Kalats, who all went through that, um, that, that cycle and AIS and all of this stuff. So I didn't get any of that. I came at the back end and sort of through St. George, which was more, wasn't to become a professional. It was just like I, I was able to do it and study at the same time. And then the football career just happened after having a trial at Sydney United and, um, just exploded into four years of, of unbelievable um, uh, 
um, success for me personally because I was actually then living a dream that I never thought would happen. Um, and then I was playing with the likes of Palats, Popovich, um, you know, all, all these, Milicic, all these kind of guys. Marusic, whoever remembers him, fantastic player. Um, so there's so many, so many good players, talented players at that time. Um, and that's where I learned the culture, my culture, Croatian culture mixed with being born in Australia and those cultures merging, which is probably why, you know, there's all this debate about youth development because what I remember is those cultures, that strong Croatian culture, whether it be Croatian, Italian, Greek, that culture merged with our Australian mentality was something that made us very, very strong and, and gave us that pathway to become not only players and play at a high level and mo, mo, you know, many players came through Sydney United and other clubs to become Socceroos and play overseas. But also now you're seeing a lot of those guys in um, um, being, whether it be in media or coaching, very prominent figures. Didn't your dad want you to be a lawyer? I remember you said. Yeah. So <laughs> you wanted, yeah. So I was studying law and then work and then playing at uh, St George, and obviously the law was the number one. So the St George was like shouldn't get in the way with that. And then the Sydney United had happened, and it was similar. I had to do so. I was basically studying law. I was working at a law firm, so I had to go, whatever it was, six, six in the morning, drive to, to work, which was one hour away from where I was living at the time, uh, work, work a full day, um, and then either go to training or go to university, whichever it was. So back then, we were training three days a week and then playing a game on the weekend. So uh, it, was, it was like a, a seven-day-a-week uh, adventure. But for me, it was, it was perfect because I was actually playing. And then so... Just the fact that I was able to play for Sydney United, my childhood uh, club was was fantastic, and um, yeah, and then obviously, as first year Sydney United and and law was like this, second year started creeping up, and then the fourth year I was I made my first appearance for for Australia, and then it was like you could see that the football was going in the in that direction, which I was quite happy about. So <laughs> maybe my father not so much, uh, and then I made the the um, uh, jump overseas and then that was it, you know. And back then, I'm um, really showing my age now, back then there was no online study or anything like that. So I had to pretty much abandon the, the law. Yeah. What took you over there? Obviously, you scored a lot of goals at Sydney United, but uh, you got that move to, I don't know how you pronounce this, Arno, is it? Arno? Yeah. Arno, Ar yeah. 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 So just tell us how that came about and then you moved to Um after that. Yeah, so as I said, in the four years where everything was going, um, just going, you know, nice progression for me. It was just getting better, better and better. And then in the end, I was leading goal scorer in the fourth year um, um, in the competition. And, and Terry Venables was the new soccer coach. And... Before then, I was never a chance in any of the national teams. But Terry Venables came in and he was looking at the league and, um, and he said um, there was a, there was a three-match series where we were playing um, only Australian-based players. So the overseas-based players weren't coming. So, so from the pool of players here, I was the leading goal scorer. So he, he straight away put me in that squad. And then from there, I played three international games. And that sort of then gave me a bit of an international um, appeal, I guess. And, and I was able to then start um, looking at overseas or have an agent that was looking at overseas clubs. I had a couple of offers. Um, and one of them was for Grasshopper Zurich to buy me an RL, which was in the first division, to, um, to then play me. Um, sort of like on, an, on a loan basis, which was quite common back then. The other one was Feyenoord would buy me and then loan me out to their second division club. So we picked the first division. So I was playing in the highest league over there. That's why I picked Switzerland. Um, and that was also with, after a discussion with Terry Venables. And then, that, then I went overseas. So they went to Switzerland. It was a tough year, more because of the whole homesick. And I just wasn't prepared for for moving overseas and living overseas, you know, I mean, they, they, you know, they gave me apartment and car and, but I had this apartment that I, you know, you know, I was Croatian, 
son of uh, <laughs> of somebody, my, my mom who used to do everything for me. So I had to learn how to cook and clean and do all this stuff and just li- life in a, in a different world on my own was just very tough to, to get used to on top of the pressure of then having to perform at a much different level now. So that was tough the first year and then um, sort of wanted to get out of Switzerland and so that because of that whole experience and then had a trial with Ulm. Ralph Rannick, who came in, and I went to a preseason trial with them in Austria. They were they were they were doing a camp in Austria, and that just went um, um, just when everything went smoothly. It was like a, just 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 everything fit perfectly there. Then signed for Ulm, and then um, they were in the second division, second Bundesliga at the time, and then just an unbelievable year at uh, Ulm, and got promoted straight straight to the Bundesliga. So then. Then I spent a couple of years in the Bundesliga, transferred over to Unterhaking when 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 Ulm got relegated, um, and then after that went to England, Scotland, back to Germany, and then back to Sydney. So that was sort of the career. As you said, you moved to England shortly after that, uh, playing for Walsall with uh, Steve Corriger, among other yeah. people. Was that the first time you met Steve, or do you obviously knew him through the the national team? No, we knew each other from a young age through the national team. And, um, you know, obviously then um, through Walsall, you know, we were just uh, Best mates. pretty much inseparable anyway. And we were also in the national team was the same thing. So, so then it just became, um, uh, it was very easy uh, living and playing in Walsall. It was very, very enjoyable um, that year there. You know, in Birmingham, it was great living there. And uh, well, that, well, that was the closest city to Walsall, so that's where I was living anyway. Um, so it was, it, was a, it was a brilliant year. And obviously, I would have liked to have stayed longer, but the whole work permit thing meant I had to keep uh, applying every year for a work permit. So then the, uh, every year, the situation on, re- regarding how many Socceroo games you play changed and the problem that we had is sometimes we play one or two games soccer games in a year it's not like now where they play many games there was sometimes you didn't play a game for what for a whole year or something you know it was crazy so how are you going to get a quota up when you're not even playing and then if you miss one game you're missing maybe 50 percent of the games in that year so um that was the problem there so then yeah so the time with bimby was excellent and obviously then we 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 linked up again at sydney fc later on and spent three years there, so uh, as, as as players. So yeah, uh, just interesting how our life takes you in those kind of directions. Yeah, and also the, uh, the the was it the time when Merson was Paul Merson was player coach at that point, or was that no, he came after? after. He yeah. came up. I think he waited till Bimbi and I left, and then uh, <laughs> and then he decided to join. <laughs> So you did play with um, the current Belgian manager, didn't you, uh, Roberto Martinez? There. Yeah, yeah, we did. We did. Right. He was actually a good, good friend. Still is a good friend uh, of ours. And uh, um, yeah, we, had, we we were actually together quite a lot. Um, and and it was, uh, I think it was that that foreigner culture kind of thing. It was it was great. And um, he always had a very sharp mind and uh, was always thinking about coaching. Um, Anyway, Robbie, it's funny, funny looking back and seeing how people used to speak about football while they were playing, and then for that evolution and the way it happened with 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 Rob was was unbelievable. And now, obviously, to be one of the best coaches in the world, um, just 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 so good to see his uh, progress. And uh, it's been difficult to link up with him since this has all happened. But um, but at one stage, I'd love to just see see how he's going with his and 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 be a part of. Um, or at least to get to see how he works, but um, that's something for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Then after the Walsall, so obviously you moved to Aberdeen. Now I know you did uh, score some very important goals at Aberdeen, including a, a winner in uh, at Parkhead at one stage in a cup tie, I think. Remember, or was it league? No, that was a league game. But what made that one was um, that was a special one because. At the time, Celtic had gone 77 or 78 games unbeaten at home, and that was in all competitions. So they obviously had a lot of Champions League games. They were in Champions League every year, so they were having the Manchester United's, Barcelona's, um, and all these guys coming to Parkhead, and they hadn't lost. So that was a massive run of games where they hadn't lost a game at home. And then comes Aberdeen, who weren't really having a great season, and then we beat them. And um, Martin O'Neill was the coach at the time. He was fuming. 
because they just run, they'd actually just won the league. And then we came in and then um, uh, beat them to, to, to end this amazing home record. And I scored the winner there. So that's why even now I get a lot of tweets from, <laughs> from whenever they play each other. It's, so it seems to be that memory that keeps popping up. So that was nice. Uh, what was it? Otherwise, maybe not the best, best year in total. I mean, we didn't finish too well. So that was sort of... Uh, um, yeah, not. Uh, it was a nice, nice sort of memory um, for that year. Yeah. And then after you had a brief spell back in Germany, and then came home when the when the A League was starting up. How did you sort of find out about that and get invited to come and, and play for Sydney FC? So I was in Germany, and then um, basically there were a couple of agents that were contacting me about this new league that was starting up, and um, even while I was in in Scotland. Um, there were there were reporters who were asking, oh, what about this new A League, this concept? And I, you know, I thought it was a great idea. And then, um, but I didn't. I was, you know, probably my first thought was a little bit skeptical because we'd heard about a lot of things about Australian football and and the way everything was going. So I never never really thought too much about it. But then I then I got targeted and and approached while I was in Germany. I just thought this was the time to 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 go back. I just really felt that. Um, and especially because I really believed that it was going to be something, something excellent. I wanted to be there at the start of it. Um, so that was the thought behind it. And, and, the, and the first months of being involved with CDFC were unbelievable. It was really a great energy um, to, you know, being there and experiencing all that. Um, on the field, uh, it wasn't, wasn't how I would like to have um, played and how I would have liked to have um, finished my career a lot of injuries a lot of problems with especially my back and my calves um, and that was sort of something that just uh, killed those three years for me and then obviously the pressure of being a name that people wanted to play uh, you know expected more from um, so that was a bit disappointing but the whole experience of for especially going there the first year was was unbelievable and Dwight you're coming and all these experiences even the six months leading into the first thing where we went overseas and and played in 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 what was a sort of like a Champions League tournament or Club World Cup and all this all these experiences were unbelievable and uh, so 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 good memories mixed in with not uh, some not so good memories but then coming full circle and then coaching at Sydney FC um, so so still Sydney FC a big part of uh, a big bond there for me um, and a great experience overall. I was going to say, it couldn't have been that bad. I think you won the OFC at the very beginning when you first came there. And that put yeah. you into the, or put the club into Club World Championships, uh, which would have been a fantastic experience. And obviously, season one won the title and played alongside Dwight York. Um, yeah, as you say, there would have been some fantastic experiences, some fantastic stories with Dwight there were I mean it was it was unbelievable seeing a, a player of that caliber come here and just the way that he he um, uh, approached the role and and, and what, by, by role I mean yes he was a player but everybody was like the whole league was basically looking at Dwight at that time and it was like, like amazing this guy was here so the way that he he was around the guys in dressing room was fantastic I mean um, he just he just put himself on the level of the boys. And, you know, this is some guy that just had so much media attention, whether it was in football or his life outside of football. And we all know that, you know, he's, he's, he was a star on and off the field. So the, just the way that he, he married that all together and made it seem seamless and brought all the guys along with him and made us all feel like, you know, that he, he wasn't on a different level. I thought that was fantastic. And that made the year so enjoyable. And um, I guess... Uh, from that part of it, you're right. It was it was unbelievable. But for me personally, because of the injuries, I mean, I was still a socceroo, and we were leading into that 2006 World Cup in 2005. Uh, I played my last game so uh, against Indonesia in Perth and scored a goal in that game. And then after that, because of injuries and not playing for Sydney uh, Sydney FC, um, that was my last game. So it's sort of that's where. The, the career started to um, come to an end for me. So good times at the start, but then during that three years and, and, and really that realisation that this is the end of my, my career and, and the injuries are not going to allow me to, to go any further. That was, that was just sort of the hard part. 
Um, and then, but out from outside, the fans still expecting, well, this guy's, you know, come back as a, as a socceroo, you expect more. So that's the understandable hard thing about coming back to Australia at the end of your career. Um, that's the probably the side of it where it can go either good way you finish on a high or the way I, w- I finished where, you know, basically finish with injuries. You mentioned the Socceroos there, 30 caps for the, the Socceroos, uh, plenty of goals as well. There's one highlight of scoring nine in, in one game, which uh, you never get the credit for because Archie Thompson scored 13 in the same game. But it's, it's still, is that still, a, a, well, his is a world record, is yours still the second biggest? Yeah, it was. Eight. I scored eight. Archie scored thirteen. I scored eight. That's um, but look, that's a funny one to look at. I mean, it's not a. Um, we did we we didn't want to be playing teams that obviously ha- have a lot to do into to build up their. You know, they're they're on a different level. We're on a different level to big Euro- t- European teams, but a lot of those teams are on a different level to us. So we don't want to go into games and win win by um, double digit scores. But that's just that's just what it was for us. And that game just sort of evolved into something that was, you know, so, in, you know, there were a lot of games where we were scoring, you know, 9, 10, 11. So this wasn't any different until it was just sort of goal after goal after goal. So we didn't even realise what was happening until probably in the set lateness, well, early in the second half where it was like, oh, we're scoring a lot, lot of goals here. So it's sort of a, not, a, not a memory where I think about, um, like, it's interesting, obviously, because you scored so many goals in the game, but, um, you want to be, you want to be remembering the goals in big games and the goals against, um, you know, uh, big teams or teams at the same same level. So, yeah, but still, it's a good record to have thirty goals and uh, sorry, twenty goals in thirty games. <laughs> it's not a bad record, but behind it, there were some of those bigger bigger score lines that um, that help prop up the numbers. Yeah. So, what what were your highlights of playing for the Socceroos? Uh, well, geez, I mean, for me, just the, the, you know, we went to Confederation Cup um, in in Korea and Japan. What was that, 2002, I think it was? Yeah, that was um, 2001. That was fantastic. We got to the final um, there, uh, played Japan and lost to Japan. Uh, um, no, sorry, we lost to Brazil. We, we lost to Japan in the semifinal, beat Brazil, uh, beat Brazil in the third playoff. So that was the... That was a big highlight, that, that tournament. That was great. Um, but also for me, there was one game against Scotland, which was, I can't even remember the year now, but I was going through a tough time in Germany. I wasn't playing regularly, um, but I was still getting called up for the Socceroos and, uh, and, and, and playing time. I was pretty much playing all the time for the Socceroos, but not playing for my club, which was a funny situation. Um, but the performances for the, for the Socceroos were, were good. So uh, Frank Farina kept including me and kept playing me. And this was a game where I wasn't playing for, um, for my team, Unterhaking, in Germany, in the Bundesliga. Went there to, to Scotland. Mark Viduka was supposed to play this game, but got injured before the game. So I played. I scored. We won 2-0. It was sort of a big game for us as well. That was a, Scotland at the time was a big name for us to be playing. Us playing at, um, uh, in Scotland. So... For us to then win 2-0 was a big one for me to score. was a big, big uh, moment. Um, and then also to go back to Germany and, and with that goal behind me was a big lift as well. So I, I really remember that one. That was a great experience for me. But generally, any camp that we went back um, and, and got together with the, with the Socceroos was just such a great bonding experience. At that time, everybody was playing at big clubs around Europe or big leagues around Europe. So we were all coming back together with great experiences. And um, I just remember that in a very, very positive light. Your broadcasting career, some big highlights there as well, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, never really thought about broadcasting until the final years, like I mentioned, at Sydney FC. And then, I, you know, I sort of was doing doing interviews there and a couple of people saying, oh, you, you know, you're pretty good at this. Why don't you try doing some media after? So then sort of at the end of my Sydney, Sydney FC career was when I was already thinking about doing media, doing coaching. Uh, what am I going to do after football? Which is, is, is not an easy thought even for guys now. That's why the, through the PFA and all of this, we're trying, be trying to help players think about career after football because you never know what, what might happen. Um, and that's what happened to me. It sort of hit me 
without all that thought. So I'm, I'm fortunate that I landed in a media career and, and coaching. Um, but yeah, started at, uh, I think the first one was Fox Sports News, just doing sort of like a few segments there. Um, worked a little bit at ESPN, then at uh, Channel 10, where you were at the time, and and, um, and that show, World, World Football News, which was also a great experience and something totally new at the time for, for us here in Australia. So all these experiences, and then ended up at SBS and spent a long, long time at SBS and worked on three World Cups, went into hosting, which, um, you know, as you would know better than most, um, it's not an easy thing to... to to do and it's a skill that really is a tough skill to learn the, the whole reading the auto cue and being a host and leading and driving driving programs that was that was something that was quite daunting and that was a that was a sort of jump in the deep end get out of your comfort zone kind of moment saying okay yeah I can do the the, the expert analyst but to be a host as an ex-player is something not not uh, I think probably not something everybody can can do and I de definitely didn't think I could do it but I worked hard at it, and and you know, even though there were some some really difficult moments, and probably didn't look good at home on TV, that's for sure. But I tried to just push through that, and um, and uh, then had some great experiences uh, hosting from the Sydney studio uh, the world uh, the Brazil World Cup, but then being um, being on the sidelines in Russia and travelling around different cities, and then being in the studio with uh, Foz and Lucy. Um, for the Russia World Cup was fantastic. I mean, that was such an experience. Um, I, I loved being in Russia. I mean, it was not, not a country I thought about too much before. Um, and it was just a, just a great country, well-organized, unbelievable tournament. Um, and one of those experiences I'll never forget.